Welcome everybody to another episode of Compliance Reality, where we discuss the reality of compliance enforcement and compliance programs today. Today we're going to have a topic of don't get soaked, compliance issues with foot baths. This is something I saw uh, recently uh, crop up a couple different times in the enforcement area and I thought, hey, let's just do a quick um, presentation on foot baths. My name is Dr. C.J. Wolf. I have over 22 years of full-time compliance experience working for organizations such as Intermountain Healthcare, University of Texas System, MD Anderson Cancer Center, and also an international medical device company. I also hold university faculty appointments where I teach in healthcare, and I do a lot of private compliance and coding consulting and training for organizations. So if you need help in that area, please keep me in mind. You can reach me at the email below, info at compliancereality.com. I have multiple certifications as an internal auditor, as a professional coder, outpatient coder, and then multiple certifications in healthcare compliance, as including privacy and research compliance and those sorts of things. I left clinical practice many years ago and have been doing full-time compliance work for over 22 years. So let's jump into today's topic, and I'm going to start with two enforcement cases. The first was a Mississippi podiatrist who was charged for this alleged foot bath scheme. And I'm going to tell the story of, of this foot bath scheme um, that kind of occurred over multiple years. We're going to start with the end, which are a couple of these enforcement cases, and I just think there's going to be more enforcement cases. These were some of the most recent ones, and I'm going to look into my crystal ball and say, you know what? These two cropped up. There were warnings a couple of years ago about these issues, and I think these are just the, the tip of the iceberg, and we're going to see some more of this moving forward. Um, this particular individual, uh, the allegations with this podiatrist were that uh, he he caused pharmacies to submit false and fraudulent claims for medically unnecessary foot bath medications. And, and the gist here is that the, the doctor w allegedly was prescribing these multiple and, and high volume medications that patients would put, uh, you know, they would dissolve them in a foot bath solution and then they would, they would soak their feet and that was supposedly helping them in some way. Um, the, these, this case really comes down to a medical necessity issue that these medications were not medically necessary in the eyes of the government, and, this, and these are the allegations. Uh, it was a large uh, process. You can see that the allegations include um, inappropriately reimbursements that approximated about $4.9 million. And then in this particular case, in addition to sending patients to other pharmacies for these for these medications, uh, it was alleged that this doctor also opened his own pharmacy to further this this billing uh, scheme, allegedly. The doctor, it was also alleged that the doctor solicited and received kickbacks and bribes in exchange for ordering and arranging for the ordering of these, what are known as high adjudication foot bath and other medications that were dispensed to beneficiaries and uh, that he prescribed medically unnecessary high adjudication foot bath medications and other medications to these beneficiaries. There were also some other allegations of um, some genetic testing being done on toenails um, and some other lab testing being done on toenails that were unlikely to yield anything of, of benefit and uh, that that was being done to, to generate some additional reimbursement as well. The second case is very similar. Uh, this is a podiatrist from Tennessee, and this indictment alleged that this Dr. Lucas chose medications to prescribe and dispense based on the anticipated reimbursement amount rather than medical necessity. And I'm going to show you uh, on this next slide an example of one of the prescriptions written um, that in 2019, this doctor wrote a prescription to a patient for over a thousand capsules of vancomycin, 7,600 grams of econazole cream, and 180 grams of lidocaine, all to be dissolved in a foot bath, uh, which allegedly caused Medicare to reimburse his pharmacy over $18,000 for dispensing these drugs for just this one prescription. Uh, it it was also alleged that from around October of 2018 to the present, 
Lucas uh, um, allegedly caused his pharmacies to submit nearly $4 million in claims for these types of expensive foot bath medications that were not uh, medically necessary. So those are some of the allegations associated with these two enforcement cases that I saw crop up kind of at around the same time. And so I looked into it a little bit more and thought, hmm, this is interesting. And many of you listening may already be aware of this, but I wasn't aware of it until I looked into it further, uh, that some enforcement agencies were already talking about the dangers and the risks and fraud alerts associated with these foot baths a couple of years ago. And we're now seeing some of the, the settlements and the cases um, come to fruition. Um, these things typically case, take, you know, a couple of years. But if you look at the timing, the announcements of the fraud alerts were right around the time when these two doctors allegedly started uh, this type of billing. And I really think we're going to see some others come forward in the next uh, months and years. So I wanted to touch base on what the enforcement agencies were saying previously. First one was um, the OIG. And so the OIG had a, a, a chief medical officer, Dr. Julie Tatesman, and um, she presented at the American Podiatric Medical Association. I found this, this was some years back, but the concepts I think are still applicable that uh, OIG looks at podiatry, um, they look at uh, high-risk areas, and these are some of the things that she pointed out in her presentation. You can see the links here on the slides. And again, as always, if you're just listening to the podcast, uh, I'll include these links in the show notes. You can also link back to the to the video online and watch the video with the slides as visuals. It was interesting because one of the first slides here on the left under the title slide are some compliance program tips that uh, Dr. Tatesman gave to the American Podiatric Medical Association in her presentation. Number one, make compliance plans a priority now and know your fraud and abuse risk areas. I think that's really important because, you know, if you're a cardiovascular surgeon, this particular issue of foot baths is probably not um, going to be a high risk area for you. You have other risks though, as a cardiovascular surgeon. And I think this point, the second tip there, know your fraud and abuse risk areas. That is so important for, for your specialty, um, for your hospital, for your facility, whatever kind of provider type you are, maybe you're a manufacturer, whatever, you should know the specific risk areas. And I think one way to do that is to do a risk assessment or to have a risk assessment done. So I've done these before, uh, both internally, I've done them as an external consultant as well. There's no rule on how you're supposed to do these, but it's important that you're doing risk assessments to see, oh, for our specialty area, are we focused on the higher risk areas? And interestingly, the Department of Justice issued uh, a couple of years ago an evaluation guidance document for how the Department of Justice could evaluate compliance programs. And one of the things they say in that document is you should, you know, does the organization spend all their time on kind of low risk areas because those might be easy to deal with or that those, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, those might be, you know, a comfort, le a comfort area and a comfort zone, uh, or are organizations seriously looking at what truly are the biggest risks and tackling those? Some of the examples that she shared are on the right side of this screen. Uh, she gave examples of three different doctors. Uh, one is upcoding. That's common, not just in podiatry. That's common anywhere where coding, uh, either diagnosis coding or procedure coding, CPT coding, where, where those codes dictate or affect the reimbursement level. So upcoding is an issue. Unbundling is an issue as, as the next example that she shared here uh, with the podiatrist. But again, these can be done in other, other specialties where you unbundle, where instead of getting paid for the total amount for the total procedure, where there may be a code or a, a reimbursement amount for that entire procedure, the provider breaks up that procedure into smaller components and bills for all those smaller components. And if you bill for smaller components as separate items, your total reimbursement amount will be higher than if you're billing just for the overall procedure. And so that's called unbundling. And then medically unnecessary services is kind of the foundation of, of claims. You shouldn't be doing something and billing for it if it wasn't medically necessary to begin with. So you might document it exactly correct. You might 
code it correctly, but if it wasn't medically necessary to begin with, then a coding audit's not really going to catch that. And so I'm a real proponent of making sure you're doing medical necessity audits with people who have clinical experience and background to, to be able to identify, uh, is this really medically necessary or not? So I found this, this interesting uh, as a kind of a proactive approach that the OIG leadership was going to this Podiatric Medical Association conference and, and presented some of these things. A lot of other really interesting things on these slides that you should uh, probably look at with the link here. Uh, the other thing that I noticed is that back in 2019, towards the end of the year, there were a bunch of fraud alerts coming through, uh, especially f as it related to Medicare uh, Part D, you know, the, the drug uh, benefit. And um, I just found a couple. If you just Google podiatry, foot bath, or foot soak, you can find all of these um, alerts that were coming up back in, in the 2019. And if you remember back a few slides on the enforcement cases I shared, that's when these issues started. Well, some people probably heeded these warnings and, and some others may not have, and that may have brought about these allegations and, and potential settlements and, and cases. But you can see here, Blue Cross Blue Shield learned of direct marketing campaigns for foot soaks used to treat foot disorders and that prescriptions were being written for medications that are traditionally used and indicated for administration orally, IV, or through direct application. These prescription medications are not FDA approved nor generally medically necessary when dispensed in a basin with water as a foot soak. Large numbers of prescriptions for the following medications are being used. I'm going to share a slide with the types of medications. I just wanted to share with you a couple headlines of uh, entities that were kind of publishing and communicating these fraud alerts. Uh, the other one was an example from a Denver uh, health medical plan. Uh, the Centers for uh, Medicare Medicaid Services, in collaboration with the iMedic, have, has made has been made aware of questionable, pres questionable prescribing and dispensing of multiple drugs, typically antibiotics, antifungals, that are being used in a foot bath. So what I find interesting about this story is that these warnings were given, and if we were to go back in time, are we heeding warnings that are being given because these things don't show their face in a settlement until a couple years later. And, and that's what I've put together kind of in this storyline is that these warnings were, were provided, you know, some probably heeded the warnings and others didn't. And I think we're going to see more cases because these warnings were given and people did not heed them. So here on the next slide, I'm going to share with you the kinds of drugs that um, were, you know, there as potential abuse for this foot bath uh, scheme or foot bath uh, process. Large on the left side of the screen, large numbers of prescriptions for the following meds are being issued. Look at all of these: gentamicin, mu, uh, mupirocin, sorry, oxyconazole cream, daptomycin, all these: tobramycin, doxycycline, uh, econazole, erythromycin. You can see all the different things. This isn't a, a complete list, but this is a, an example of the types of things I also shared in that put that enforcement case. Um, that one example that the press release contained about the one prescription the doctor wrote for all those meds. So if, if you're concerned about this, you could probably do some data analysis and see if people are prescribing certain medicines in high volumes. So on the right, you can see that medical record reviews indicated that the prescriptions are marketed as innovative techniques or hydrotherapy and specialized antifungals. In reality, these are all prescriptions written for, and here are some examples, 7,200 units of clindamycin in a single script, 120 bottles, 600 units of gentamicin for a 15-day supply, another 120 bottles. Those are large, large volumes. 900 units of ketoconazole cream, 30 tubes, 1,800 units of erythromycin, 30 tubes. So you could do some data uh, analytics and see what kinds of scripts are being written. And if you have these high volumes here, it may lead you down a trail of, oh, yep, these are related to these foot soaks or foot baths, and there may be some issues here for you to look into. Uh, the other thing I found in looking at the kind of the backstory or historical, um, I found this from the California Senior Medicare Patrol, Patrol webinar. This was just one of the slides. This was kind of a webinar where they were warning about potential um, schemes and fraud 
alerts and all those sorts of things. And one of the slides talked about this. Beware of a free foot spa. It was an FBI warning, uh, Medicare fraud scheme, foot bath soak products. Telemarketers contact Medicare Part D beneficiaries offering free foot spa. Pharmacy instructs providers to mix the meds with water in order to soak their feet. There was questionable prescribing and dispensing of multiple drugs. As we've said already, typically antibiotics, antifungals are being used in a foot bath. And then dispense medications may be medically unnecessary. There may be limited clinical value and may be harmful to patients in some cases. So I found this kind of backstory really interesting. And you, we often put the pieces together after the settlements come out, but, but it's interesting. So what is happening real time, even if you're not in podiatry, what is happening real time today that could be causing issues you need to take seriously? You shouldn't wait until the enforcement comes out two years from now, because by then you may have two years worth of claims that were inappropriate. So it's, it's putting all those pieces together. Some other things I wanted to share with you are the Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, where foot care is described. I'm providing you the link here. Uh, this is just a screenshot of, of the first couple paragraphs. There are many pages of what's covered by Medicare for foot care, all sorts of exclusions from coverage and those sorts of things. Other things you should be looking at are MLNs or the Medicare Learning Network. Uh, MLN Matters are publications. Um, this one that I'm sharing here uh, and the link is a seven-page document about foot care coverage guidelines, what's excluded from coverage, conditions that might warrant coverage, those sorts of things. And and there, there can be, it's not always black and white, there can be some gray area, which is why I really think you need um, people involved in your compliance program doing reviews, monitoring, auditing, risk assessments that, that have both you know, a, a compliance background as well as some background in the, in the clinical thing. Because this is really where the two worlds meet, right? The compliance world or the legal world meets with the clinical world and the coverage rules. And you get all sorts of policies written and you have to dig down and, and find those specific policies. Um, another example, which I'm not including on the slide, but you should always be aware of, are the LCDs, local coverage determinations, or the NCDs, national coverage determinations. These are policies published by either Medicare nationally, if they're an NCD, or by a local contractor, if they're an LCD. And you need to follow those guidelines as well. And I think what... Some of this has prompted OIG to be proactive in looking at some other podiatry services. So I think we're going to see some things moving forward. This next slide is their work, a work plan item that they recently published. They are going to look at, as part of their work plan, they're going to look at Medicare Part B payments for podiatry and ancillary services. And the thing that, that caught my attention here was prior OIG work identified inappropriate payments for podiatry and ancillary services. We'll review Part B payments to determine whether these services were medically necessary and supported in accordance with Medicare requirements. So the OIG is saying, look, we're going to be doing some work in this area. We're going to proactively audit this stuff. If you uh, are involved in in podiatry services or foot care you might want to be you know considering how can uh, you best use your compliance resources to identify potential risk areas in this area. Uh, some of the specifics mentioned in this, um, they talk about how Part B may cover certain services. However, uh, if they are performed one as a necessary and integral part of otherwise covered services, Two, for the treatment of warts on the foot. Three, in the presence of a systemic condition or conditions. And four, for the treatment of infected toenails. Um, those are things that the OIG says Part B generally does not cover routine foot care services, such as the cutting or removal of corns and calluses or trimming, cutting, clipping, or debridement um, of toenails. Um but Part B may cover those services, however, if they're performed of those four things. So they also go on to say Medicare generally does not cover E&M services. Those are evaluations and management services when, are they, when they are provided on the same day as another podiatry service, such as nail debridement performed as a covered service. However, an E&M service may be covered if it is a significant, separately identifiable service. So um, if you've been listening to the, the sessions on this channel or the podcast, you'll, you'll remember that a few 
um, episodes back, we talked about Modifier 25. That's exactly what they're getting at here with this announcement in the OIG work plan about an E&M on the same day as a procedure. You'd have to use Modifier 25 on the E&M code to get both the E&M paid and the procedure. But you should only use that modifier under certain circumstances. And um, the previous uh, session or presentation we did on Modifier 25 talks a little bit more about when it's allowed and when it's not it's subjective, it, not really subjective, but it's, it's not, there's not a black and white rule for you can always do it or you always can't. It's, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's um, encounter specific. That's probably a better way to say what I was trying to say. Every encounter needs to be reviewed and determined, okay, was 25 modifier appropriate for this particular encounter? Um, so if you're always adding modifier 25, that may be a red flag. So um, anyway, that was a kind of a quick review of, of a couple of podiatry enforcement cases that came up and then the, the story behind it. If you have questions about this presentation, please email us at info at compliancereality.com. And if you need help with your compliance program or if you need help with training people uh, or audits or risk assessments or all these things that we've I've talked about in this presentation and others, please reach out to us and um Let's talk about how we might be able to help you. Again, info at compliancereality.com. Thanks for listening to another episode. If you like these, please hit the like button. Please subscribe. Please share with your friends. And uh, also email us if there's a topic that you'd like to hear more about. So uh, thanks for listening. Have a great day.